Welcome everyone. I see we have about 29 participants um, for the Master Food Preservers third Thursday uh, tuna demonstration. And uh, my name is Dorina Espinosa. I am the Master Food Preserver Advisor in Humboldt and Delmar Counties. And I'm extremely grateful for our two Master Food Preservers, Eileen Harris and Joyce Houston, for volunteering to do this presentation. I will let them each introduce themselves and I'll stop sharing the screen. Okay, do you want me to introduce myself first? Please. Go right ahead. Okay, so I'm Eileen Harris and um, I was trained in 2015 here in Humboldt County and our training is through UC Davis, so the Regents of California get our money, which we do pay for. <laughs> We do pay for it, but we get a, so much reward in return. And, and another time we can talk about the training if you're interested. Um, and I have loved working face to face with lots of folks since 2015. This is our first time doing Zoom. And um, I'm just so glad that we're doing something because it's been so quiet since February and um, anyway Joyce and I and Marina have had a lot of fun planning this and I, I hope that you enjoy it I know you will please uh, take notes don't you don't have to take notes about what we're doing because that's going to be given to you but if you can jot down anything that you think we can improve upon we plan to do this every Thursday I mean every month on the third Thursday so anyway that's me and here's Joyce Hello, <laughs> I'm Joyce Houston, and uh, I've been a uh, Master Food Preserver since 2012. That was the first class of Master Food Preservers here in Humboldt County. And I uh, had a, a background in nutrition and was the public health nutritionist for Humboldt County for a number of years. This is going to be an interesting presentation uh, I, I too hope that you enjoy it and uh, that there aren't too many foibles that um, are irreparable. Um, there may be a few, but um, <laughs> I'm sure we can, we can back up and correct any. You may wonder about the direction of my screen and I wanted you to be able to see not only what I'm going to be doing on the cutting board, but also my pressure canner in the background here. So every once in a while when I'm presenting, I'm kind of probably going to come in like, hello. That's so, good. Uh, That's perfect. <laughs> don't, be, don't be surprised. I will appear and disappear. <laughs> so one, a couple of logistics before we, um, before I give it off to Eileen and Joyce. If um, your camera's on, I'm going to ask you to turn your camera off, and I will also uh, mute you only because the camera might make the connection for Eileen and Joyce uh, unstable, their internet connection. And then I'm requesting the mute because that will make it easier for us to hear Eileen and Joyce. And then in terms of view, so on the top of your screen, I hope you have something called speaker view. If you have speaker view and you turn that on, you'll be able to see more of the speaker. Um, so uh, that should help you in terms of increasing the size of the image that you see. Please use chat if you'd like to um, send me a note. I will be watching that the whole time to make sure I answer your questions as we go. And if you have any problems right now with the uh, audio visual, also send me a note in chat. And I will now go off screen and mute myself. And then Joyce, take it away. Okay. Okay, Eileen, you want to tell us a little bit about the uh, equipment we need? Yes, I, I will. So we need, you need to have a pressure canner. It's different from a pressure cooker because it allows the um, jars to, the air inside to evaporate and, and it's um, tight. If you want to know the physics about it, you can look it up on the internet because we don't have time to explain it all. But this is my, um, this is my manual for my pressure cooker. 
And uh, I mean, my pressure canner. See, there I go. First foible, Joyce. Right. Okay. Down. And um, <laughs> so this is important to have your manual. Sometimes people pick up pressure canners at a garage sale or they're given one. That's great because they last forever unless there's something, you know, wrong with them. And oftentimes you can get the manual online. So, but you definitely need the manual because they're different. And Joyce will show you hers, which is mine is an All-American. And I'll show you that the, um, the way it fits, it's metal to metal. The top goes on and there's no gasket. And I like, I really like the way these fit. And I'll show you that in just a minute. But I want Joyce to show hers. Sure. My, uh, my uh, pressure canner is a Presto. And it's one, the one that I would say that is priced most reasonably and is very commonly available in many different stores. And as Eileen said, it has very specific directions inside about, for example, the amount of water that you need to put into your canner be when you process foods. And the top on my canner looks different in that it has a rubber gasket around the inside that you need to check on an annual basis and keep very clean uh, so that uh, the top will seal to the bottom when you're going through the pressure canning. Joyce, also, have, you, have you ever had to replace the gasket? On this one so far, I have not. I have not, but I have had to uh, replace others. And they are readily available, uh, your, your um, hardware stores. If they handle any kind of canning goods, um, they will have the gaskets available to you. Or you can order them online. Okay, sounds good. And so there's a on. question. There's a yeah. question if an instant pot can be used. Absolutely no. not. And then also electric multi-pots have been found to be unsafe. That is correct. And one of our members found that out because she got one as a gift. And they are fine for doing um, fruit, uh, jellies, pickles, things that can be done in a boiling water bath. And we're not doing boiling water baths tonight, but uh, next month we probably will because we're going to do tomatoes and those can be acidified by adding lemon juice. And so that can Let's be done in a boiling water bath. But not tuna, has to be done in a pressure canner. Okay, in addition to the, um, the canners themselves, what other equipment do we need for the pressure okay, canning? Okay, good question. So we need jars, and um, jars are usually readily available, but if any of you can and you've been looking for jars and lids, they are precious and the prices have gone way up and they're hard to find. So hopefully you have a storage of them, which fortunately I did. I did not have to go out and buy any, and I'll explain to you what the lids and, and rings are in a minute. So for the tuna, we're going to use half pints. You can use pint jars, which are twice as big, and it's the same procedure that we're gonna do tonight, same minutes and all that. But half pints are really convenient for tuna. I have found. Joyce, have you ever done whole pints? No, because I would feel like I was drowning in tuna. It would just, <laughs> it would, it would just be too much for me to have all at one time. As you be, said, a half pint is a, yeah, a perfect it would size. Be too, too tuna, too much too tuna. So when you have the jars, and again, you can get them at yard sales too, not the lids, which we'll talk about in a minute, but, and they're reusable. You want to make sure you get a brand that's well known, like Kerr, K-E-R-R, -R, or Ball, B-A-L-L. -L. Those are the two most often used. And if you try to get by with a cheap one, you may not get a good seal. You cannot use a mayonnaise jar or a pickle jar or anything like that that you've gotten from the store. You must use canning jars. So 
what, let's say you're ready to can. These have been used before. You want to take your finger, run along the top, make sure there's no nicks, because if there are any nicks or chips, the jar won't seal. And here's a wide mouth. I like the wide mouth for tuna. And I, actually, I've been using the wide mouth for most things, except for jelly. I can use the narrow one. But the wide mouth is really convenient for tuna. It's easy to pack the tuna in. So you need you know, to Eileen, yes, when, I first, when I first used the, uh, the more squat jar, I thought, I just don't see how this could <laughs> possibly yeah. hold the same amount of tuna as the tall skinny jar. So I actually weighed and measured the albacore and by golly, it was exactly the same, exactly the same. Well, that is something called conservation that I taught my first grade class. Not so We won't go into that. <laughs> water. But th what I meant is that's the way you find out by experimenting. Different sizes, but it, she's correct. Okay, the next thing you need are lids. And these must be brand new. You cannot reuse the lid. So these are, these are new. They come in packages like this for the narrow one and like this for the wide one. And normally you can find them in the store for several dollars. I actually bought an extra box of the wide mouth and act on Eureka Natural Foods and it was sit over six dollars and and just for the lids that never happens but i needed them and i went ahead and bought it but that's the price you pay this time um i use these plastic ones after the, everything's been done to store them in because you're going to and i'll show you the this is the band that you put on and here's the wide one so here's the wide lid, the wide band, and then after you can it, we'll show you, you're going to take this off and just store the jar with the lid on it. You can wash these, save them for another time. But if you don't want to use everything in the jar, you can put, you can get these at um, Ace Hardware, and they, they are wonderful because they screw on after you've taken the lid off and you can store it in the refrigerator. So this is something from 10,000, I mean 10,000, 2018, and I just haven't erased what's on there, but I, I use them all the time. So you need, you need the lids, you need a sharp knife, and Joyce will explain that to you when she gets to her part. That is vital, and have a knife sharpener if you can. This is mine that I like, again, from a thrift store, because I'm a thrift store shopper. But um, I always have the uh, sharpener with me, just in case the knife starts getting dull. And then I wash it after I've um, sharpened it. Make sure I get all the little pieces off. Okay, you need a jar lifter. This is vital because it's going to be very hot. And we'll explain to you how you put the jars in and how you take them out. But you definitely want a jar lifter. And don't, don't try to get away with just, you know, um, I don't know, the things that you have for salad and stuff, that's not gonna work. You need something that's got a good sturdy handle, plastic, and it's made for canning. Okay, a couple more things, and, and then I'll turn it over to Joyce for the cutting. Um, after you fill the jars with the tuna, you want to make sure you have all the um, bubbles out of it so that it's up to where you are going to have it, which will be one inch, and we'll explain that to you. So, and we'll show this to you again, but you're going to go around, you can use a chopstick, nothing metal because it could ding the glass. A chopstick, um, a really thin um, spatula, or these wonderful tools that are just a, a couple of dollars. And you can um, use this as the debubbler. We'll show you that. It also has a measurement at the top 
and you can see how far up your product is and make sure it's right where you need it to be. Okay, is that it, Joyce? For I think mm, that's um, it. The recipe. The recipe. Oh yeah. yes. And now Har we need to and see Harbor the recipe, Master. Dorita. Okay. Right. Thank you. So she's going to put that up. Okay, good. So this is available for free, and. Um, you can, the hard copies, you can pick up at the Ag Center. Doreen is going to explain to you how you can do that. And they can get it online, too. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So there, you can get it online. I like having a hard copy because I like writing on it and stuff. And actually, Joyce should really talk about this because she's one of the persons who developed it. So Joyce, do you want to talk about this pamphlet a little bit? Well, I can tell you that it's very complete. It really tells you a lot about the albacore tuna of the North Coast region of California. It tells you about the most common sizes that are used for canning. And I mean, you can get albacore up to 60 pounds, but the most common sizes that are used are somewhere between 8 and 25 pounds. And actually, that's good because when you get up to your larger fish, there's a, uh, a greater possibility that they're going to be, um, they're going to have mercury in them. So it has uh, very good information about buying and storing the albacore, as well as um, filleting it, or that is cutting the fish into loins, canning it, using the pressure canner, and all of the different techniques that you need to use in order to be a safe albacore tuna canner. <laughs> and there's a great picture of a, an albacore right there. Uh, it's a beautiful fish. And, um, and on the bottom, I want you to notice of that uh, picture that there is a picture of a cutout, a fish that has had a piece cut out, and that piece that has been cut out is in front of it. And that is a loin. There are four loins in each fish, two uppers and two lowers. So I think that's pretty much the story of the book. And it also has references in it, um, which are very good to look at too. Talks about smoking tuna for canning also. Get a copy. Yeah. I use it, I use it all the time. You'll be happy you have it. So um, do you have the slide with the um, Harbor Master's phone number on it? It's on there right now, okay. Eileen. Okay, good. So what you want to do is um, you'll hear that the boats are coming in, but as soon as they sell out, they're gone. Either they've gone back out to sea or they're taking a break or whatever, but the fish sells very quickly and you can go down and buy it right off the boat. That's the best way to do it. The harbor master will give you the names of the boats that are docked at the marina and what, um, where they are, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and they'll tell you the name of the boat, the, also the captain and their phone number. And then what you wanna do is call that captain, tell them how much you want and, and whether or not you want it loined. Now, mo I'd say 99% of the master food preservers, and Joyce, correct me if I'm wrong, get it loined because it's more expensive per pound, but you don't have the waste. You, you pay for the whole fish, but when it's loined, they, they, it's, and if you get a good captain and they know they're, they cut their loins well, it's a pleasure to use it. Now, some people go out and catch their own tuna or a friend gives them a whole fish. You're on your own with that because I have never done that. <laughs> and I don't plan to. Well, I know that uh, Eileen, as I mentioned before, I tried uh, learning my own fish and actually my daughters wanted to try it too. But after I and they experienced it one time, we decided, hmm, loins are a very good deal. So yeah. that's, that's the way we've gotten our fish since then. And it's, it's beautiful. And most of, on most of the boats, I find they're, uh, 
there are the fishermen and then there is the person who comes on board and does the loining. And this is usually someone that that's what they do. So they are quick and they really get almost all of the meat. You lose very little of the meat when they're loining it. It's a good way to get it. It is. And, and albacore is the white flesh of, you know, that's the fish that is caught off our coast. And it, it is the best. I mean, you know it is and, if you buy it at the store. Albacore, the white albacore is the best. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's, really, it's really good to know also that if you go down there to get a fish, you want to take cash. Good. Good point. Yes, because um, most of them, that's what they want. They want it done quickly because usually you're waiting in line. Even if you, and, and order ahead of time, don't try yes. to go down and stand in line and be disappointed. That does happen. Yes. Okay, after, I'm going I'm to be your task taskmaster, Eileen and, and uh, Joyce. So yeah. just time sensitivity here. Okay. Okay. So we'll move okay. on. To, um, and I've told you about the jars. You want to wash them in soapy, hot soapy water. You don't need to sterilize them because they're going to be in the canner for a hundred minutes. That's an hour and 40 minutes. So you do need, you don't need to sterilize it. I do wash the lids in hot soapy water and the rings just because I'm in the habit of doing it. And I think and that's, that's a good habit. Now, each canner has a different level of water. Um, generally, it'll say, like in this booklet, it'll say two to three inches of water. And Joyce has figured out that that is, I think, four quarts of water. Per no, per no, no, three. Okay. My, actually, yeah, my, my book, uh, my pressure cooker book requests three quarts of water uh, to do the canning. But that is two to three inches, so it's about the same. Okay, and of course, see, my canner is a lot smaller than hers. Mine is 15 quart, and what's yours, Joyce? 23. 23, so she can do a lot more jars, but, um, you know, that's her level of water. You can test it and see. You want to make sure you have a... A rack in the bottom you never want to put your jars on directly on the bottom of the can so you have one of those and Joyce will show you if you can do a double decker and she'll show you what to use for that the other thing I want to add before we turn it over to her is to put um, two to three tablespoons of white vinegar or you can use apple cider vinegar don't use one of your great gourmet vinegars and the reason for that is two things first it'll cut down on the smell it'll also help with the mineral deposits so those are the two not reasons. only that there's yes. another reason there's another a third reason one. a third reason and that is that it cuts i mean the all the core is a fatty fish you know it has those wonderful omega-3 fatty acids and uh, what the vinegar does is cut those fats so that it's much easier to clean your canner after you've done your processing. Ah, it's a good thing to do. Remember the vinegar. Okay, Joyce, it's all yeah. up to you. Okay, I'm starting to add water to my canner and um, as, as I mentioned, it's uh, three quarts of water for my canner. I already have that base uh, piece on the, on the bottom of my canner. And so I am really getting ready to uh, put together the fish. And I have uh, already uh, taken some fish and jarred it. And I'm going to uh, show you the process of doing that. Keep in mind, for a 10 pound fish, you get about five pounds of loin. You've got 50% loss when you're canning albacore. So you've got five pounds of loins and you've got about five eight ounce jars of fish, okay? So keep that in mind when you're ordering your fish. If you know how many jars you wanna have at the end of your process, 
then you can just multiply that out as to how many pounds of uh, fish, whole fish you might like to have. And it's gonna be a little different for each time, but not very. Okay, now I'm gonna have to take, Eileen, say something clever because I've gotta get the fish. Clever? <laughs> Joyce is a uh, theater person, so if you ever want to be entertained, <laughs> that's not quite what I had in mind. But, uh, <laughs> okay, so the top of my head. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to uh, do some some uh, filling of jars and things. And the first thing that I wanted to show you was this is a partially frozen loin. And this is about, this is, these were not huge fish. I like to get the smaller ones. So uh, this was probably somewhere around a 10 pound fish. And this is one loin. And when you are cutting your fish, we highly recommend that you keep them partially, you don't completely thaw them keep them partially frozen because the, uh, the meat of the fish gets kind of wiggly and wobbly, you know, if it gets to be uh, totally defrosted. And so by keeping it partially frozen, it'll be easier for you to uh, cut and fit into your jars. So I have some jars here and um, let me see if I can get some ready here. I like to put a little warm water in my jars before I load them. And actually I found out uh, this afternoon when I was rereading my manual for my canner that they suggest that. So uh, it might not be a bad idea. What I'm going to be doing is adding the seasoning that I want to add. And I put it all, I don't know if you can see this, I have all of my seasonings can you see that? Uh, there they are. I have some salt. I have some Turkish smoked pepper. I have some pieces of garlic, some capers, and some small pieces of lemon. Actually, what I prefer using is preserved lemon, but um, I didn't have any of that right now. So I'm going to put Joyce, my... Yes. Why do you use warm water in your jars? Some One thing that is suggested is that it kind of tempers the jars, getting it kind of accustomed to heat. That's the only thing they don't say. But you're uh, going so, to dump it out, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's okay. not like it stays in there to be buddies with the tuna. No. Okay. Let's make sure we know that. Yes. So then I'm going to add a quarter of teaspoon of this smoked Turkish pepper. My daughters and I have found that we really love this in the albacore. And um, this is an annual or semi-annual or biannual. Every two years, one or two years, we will get together. They will come and visit me for uh, a weekend or more. And we'll be canning that weekend. And albacore is one of the things that we can. So I'm going to add just a piece of garlic, not a lot. Uh, to each of these jars, and I think I will add a couple of capers. And this will be the first time that I've actually tried capers, but I know, Dorina, you used capers in your albacore, I think. Isn't that right? That's correct. And, and how did you like that? Loved it. And Eileen, what do you like to use? And this is my go-to tahini, which is a Chili lime spice, and I discovered it two years ago, I think, 2018, in the tuna. I don't put it in every jar because I give a lot away, and I want to make sure people like it if they want the tahini. Uh, sometimes I add salt instead of tahini. Sometimes I don't add anything, and then people can put in whatever they want. Just like Joyce, I'll add lemon. Sometimes dill, I'll put in some dill weed. I've never done the capers, but I definitely want to do that. So that's on my list. I did try garlic, but I didn't care for it. So, um, you know, whatever your taste is, experiment around and, and see what you think. But tahini is really good. 
And I've never had tahine, so that's something I tried to find, but I couldn't find any of it. So the, the thing that gets tricky, now you might notice that I have on gloves because I don't want my hands to smell like albacore for the next week. <laughs> um, I know that's odd. Most yeah. people just love that fishy smell. But um, the one trick with this partially frozen fish is that it is harder to pack. And what you want to do, now I, I suggest that before you start packing your albacore, that you take a ruler and you measure from the top of your jar down to an inch, and you will find how low you should keep that fish in order for it to uh, successfully can. And this fish right now is too high because it goes a little bit before what is called the neck of the jar. So I'm gonna cut off a little bit of it here and pack it down some more. And these little pieces will be able to be used in another jar, I am sure. So I just wanted to mention the fish loin to can jar ratio. So an example is 10 pounds of fish would get you about five pounds of loins, which is about five jars. Right, which I mentioned once, but it's always good to mention again because it's an easy thing to forget. Now you may wonder why I put my spices and stuff in first. Well, I put it in first because I've been known to forget it otherwise. Um, okay, so now we're on our second jar. I'm going to let this sit for just a little bit as I'm filling the other jars so that as it thaws, I may be able to push it down a bit more. And we have cut pieces here. Move this one over so you can see. And you know, I'm doing this here at home alone right now, but it's a whole lot of fun to do it with somebody because there can be it just is. all sorts of chatter about, um, well, just about anything you want to chatter about, I guess. So that one packed a little bit more easily. Now, I don't know if you can see that there is quite a bit of uh, air bubbles right at the bottom here. Can that be seen, Karina? How about yeah, there? To, see that? Yeah. A little okay, bit, so yeah. as this um, fish thaws a bit, then we'll want to push that down more so that all of that space can be filled and um, more fish added if it needs to be. Okay, now we're on our third jar and time to get out a bit more albacore. I usually have my albacore uh, sitting in the cooler beside me so that I can easily grab it. There, we'll put so, that little... So, so Benita shared a um, re where to get the recipe for salmon and it is a different uh, process, although I've done it uh, with salmon as well, but I don't remember the recipe. So thank you, Benita, for getting giving us that link for that recipe. Salmon, uh, a recipe for salmon, I think, can also be obtained at the Alaska Cooperative Extension uh, office. And it looks like you're packing it tight and full. Canned fish yes. that I've gotten in from friends, this is a comment, from friends and neighbors in the past sometimes has just one chunk with a lot of airspace, not packed tight like that. Well, it's uh, recommended uh, that you pack it tight in order that the, you get uh, more even distrib heat distribution while you're canning it. That's, that's one of the reasons. And I... Uh, it also, I mean, it actually gives you more albacore in your jar also. If it's, if there are large air bubbles, you're not, you're not making full use of the jar. But it's that Sorry. even heat distribution that I would be most concerned about. Yes, Eileen. So um, we were talking, you might weigh it, I don't know, just to see how much goes in each jar. But the other thing I was thinking of is sometimes 
we like to cut off a couple of slices of loin and barbecue it. So, you know, you don't have to pack all the tuna into jars. You can actually- No, you can just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. That is right. Now, this is the first jar that I pack and the, the albacore has thawed more. And as I'm packing this down, you can see that um, it's getting closer to the uh, height in the jar that it should be. In fact, it's right on. So if you, you can, can hold little... it still. Yep, just hold it still right there so the camera, there we go. Okay. And nice. the bubbles are, are pretty much removed now. Okay, now I'm going to load one more jar, so we'll have four jars, and I did a sneaky thing this afternoon. I put markers on my cutting board as to how, how long I needed to uh, cut the fish in order to have it the right size for these jars. I thought that was pretty tricky. But even then, because it packs down, it, it, I need more fish. <laughs> okay. How are we doing on this one? So, as I mentioned, each one of these, we added the, um, the spices uh, before. Eileen, I think, likes to add hers at the end, because she do. must have a better memory. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but I do, I do it at the end. Okay, now I'm going to rinse off my hands, actually wash my hands with some soap and water to get the fish off of the, uh, of the gloves. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna take a paper towel, a wet paper towel, and I like to put it in a little bit of vinegar and then wipe the top rim of each jar because you want to make sure that you have any little fish bits and any oil from the fish off of the top rim of the jar so that your seal will in actuality seal. And um, so I'm going to do that right now. Actually, I'm going to just do it. So Benita shared that the minimum load canner load for a pressure canner is two quarts or four half pint jars. Actually, that, that is good information to share. I actually have sneakily already prepared eight jars that are in my refrigerator that I'm going to put in my canner. When you have a demo like this, you've got to be a little sneaky about some things. <laughs> is it important to have the fish thawed before starting the canning process? At least partially thawed, yes, because it won't pack well if it isn't. Benita, it sounds like maybe you've done a bit of canning of, of albacore before, is that right? Any words of wisdom that can be shared are always appreciated. Mm -hmm. So another person, a friend raves about her dad's canned tuna recipe that includes olive oil. Is that safe in a pressure canner? I know it would Thank not be okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. Actually, there are you know, different ways that people like to can albacore. And one of them is to add either, uh, I think it's, I can't remember if it's one to three tablespoons of water. I can look that up quickly. It's in the, it's in the albacore booklet um, or oil. And um, I personally just like to pack the tuna in there and not add any oil. And I certainly don't like to um, add water. I want the depth of flavor of the fish and by, I don't find that it dries, as long as you keep your pressure where it's supposed to be when you're canning, does not dry the fish. And also, you're getting these really valuable omega-3 fatty acids by using the fat of the fish. Now, another technique that is sometimes used is to pre-cook the fish to drain off some of that oil. Um, 
with my nutrition background, I, I don't recommend it. I, I recommend just doing the fish. If you want to add oil or water, that's up to you. So what about canning smoked or cooked boiled, as in boiled fish? I'm not sure I understand that. Sure, we had talked about the recipe coming from the National Center that they included cooking the fish. So the question was, can't, may an individual use cooked, but I don't know about the smoked, but cooked tuna. Well, you know, um, I, I have not done any smoking of fish. Um, I know that you can can smoked fish, but um, I really, I can't provide you with any information about that. I think if they go to the National Center for Home Food Preservation or one of the other resources, they might be able to find the answer to that. And they do, uh, at the back of our booklet, there are um, directions for smoking tuna for canning. And because I have never done that and not really interested in doing, I really haven't read those directions. But there is a brochure called Smoking Fish at Home Safely, and it is a Pacific Northwest Extension publication that's available online. Okay, so I, I have wiped off the top of the jars, and I've uh, put my seals on, and you'll notice that I did not touch any part of the rubber edge of those seals because if I did, I've got fishy fingers and uh, the fishy fingers might actually add a little bit of oil to that seal and make it impossible for it to actually seal. Now I'm gonna put on my rings and the thing that you, it's very tempting for a lot of people I find to just tighten these down as hard as they can screw them down. And you don't wanna do that. You want to just get them finger tight, okay? Otherwise, the air that's escaping from the uh, jar when you're pressure canning is not going to be able to get out. It's going to just sit in there gasping. So don't do it too tight, okay? You don't want to hear gasping, gasping jars. <clears throat> And then these jars, once they have been filled and the rings on, these are actually ready to put in the canner. So I'm gonna put these in the canner. These are gonna be on my bottom row. And this canner with, with these wide mouth jars, it holds eight jars, eight of these jars on the first row. And then once I've got the eight jars, then I'm going to put another one of these in between the jars so that you don't have jar on jar. However, you can do it so that you've got jar on jar if you, uh, um, what's the word I want? Stagger. Stagger. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So if you stagger them so that they are not right on the jar on, uh, that they're above. No, that they're below. No, that they're above. <laughs> the first jar. And, and is, what's the headspace again? One inch. And One inch. when you put your jars in the canner, your first row, is that covered in water or does it tend for your quartz? No. I, hang on. I will show you. Uh, actually, I will attempt to show you. I'm loading some more jars out of my refrigerator that I uh, prepared earlier. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Actually, the canner holds seven jars on the first row. Then I will put, first I'm gonna show you how you can vary that and have jars on jars in case you don't have a second one of these, of these separators. So, okay, I'm gonna do that on a couple of these, so, and then I'm just, going to do just a, a little note. dance with my iPad. Excellent. Just a note, Joyce, you yes. pulled jars out of the canner, not because that's the way to can tuna, because the 
whole jar and the canner is a, a concern. So you only did that for the purposes of this. Well, these, these jars aren't hot. They've got, they've got ice cold tuna in them right now. Uh, once they're canned, right. then you want to use your jar lifter. But certainly when you're loading your jars and they are cold, there is no need to use the jar lifter. Going from is that going from refrigerate right? going from refrigerate any danger of those cold jars from your refrigerator breaking in the canner? Well, the jars will be gradually heating, and I've never had that be a problem. Have you, Eileen? Well, I I did it this last time because my canner is smaller than yours. I did not have enough room to put them all in. But so I put them in the refrigerator, but then I took them out and let them maybe a half an hour warm up. I didn't put uh -huh. them directly from the refrigerator into the counter. I let okay. them sit on the counter a little bit. Okay, well, these will be sitting on the counter for a few minutes, but not much more than that. So this will be a test run. Okay, yep. so yep. let me show you what I, let me try to show you what I've done here. Tell me if you can see what I've done. Can you see what I've done? We can see the stagger. Okay, good. That's what I wanted you to see. Okay, so that's if you don't have a separator, then you can. Uh oh. She's, she'll come back in a bit. There okay. she is. Siri just to keeps trying to interrupt me. It's 6 17, just to let you know where we are in time. Oh, wow, it's time flying when we're having fun. Okay, so, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, twelve. I now have 12 jars in the, in the canner, and I have one quart of water in there already, and I will add my other quart, and uh, my other two quarts, and then we will start the actual canning process. Bum, bum, bum. And so... Well, I'm uh, getting this started. Eileen, you want to get on with the next part? I can do that. <clears throat> so um, Joyce is going to bring her canner up to temperature. And what's going to happen is, I'll show you on mine, it's a little bit different, but can you see this, this uh, vent here? So when the, when the canner starts heating and it gets to, the, the time where it's ready to pressurize, you will, steam will come out of here. And at first it'll start to spurt, but you wanna wait until the steam is completely steaming and you can see it. And that's what Joyce is going to do. And we're hoping before we end that you'll be able to see that, but I'm gonna describe it to you. So the steam comes up and you let that happen for 10 minutes. Time it for 10 minutes. When that 10 minutes is up, when that 10 minutes are up, pardon me, you're going to put on this regulator and you want to put it on using a mitt, a hot mitt. And I forgot to mention that before. You want to have a stack of these hot mitts because this stuff gets really, really hot. And the other thing is to wear closed-toed shoes. Now, I'm barefoot right now, but we're not actually canning. But when I do can, I make sure I have socks and closed-toed shoes on because stuff does spill. Okay, so this is going to go on with the number 10. There's numbers on this little gizmo. And um, it's going to be 10 pounds of pressure. It's actually going to be 11, but 10 is the closest one. So when that steam has gone through for 10 minutes, you're going to slip this on. And then you're going to wait until it starts to jiggle a little bit. And also on this gauge, it will come up to 11 pounds. That is when you start timing it for 100 minutes. You don't start the timing before that. So this will jiggle. 
And it doesn't jiggle constantly. It'll jiggle a little bit, stop, jiggle a little bit and stop. Some canners just have this. Some have just the gauge. Mine has both, which I'm really happy about because I can kind of watch both of them. If for any reason the pressure drops, this stops, the pressure drops below 11, you've got to heat the canner again and start all over again with your timing. So that's something, that's why you want to watch it. And Joyce said having a, a friend over or a spouse or a daughter, she's lucky that her daughters are here. My, my daughter is far, far away in Maryland, so we don't get to do it together. But if you have somebody with you, it's really helpful because the two of you can take turns watching it and it's good to have backup. So how are we on time, Dorina? We are all right. And do you mind sliding your canner over a little towards you so we can see the dial gauge a little bit better? Can you see oh, it now? Well, it's the sun in the background, but that's okay. Oh, well, I can't do anything about that. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, but I can take, no, I can't take it off. Well, I can no, take the lid off and show you. Let's see if I can do that. And what I was going to show you before I do that, the re one of the reasons I like this canner is the way it fastens. So you pull up these on either side, tamp them down. You don't do one at a time. You do two together opposite. And then you get a really good seal. Okay, I'm going to take the lid off and move the gauge here so you can see it. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay, so that's the gauge, and this is the wiggler. Okay, so while Joyce does that, I'm going to talk about depressurizing it. So let's say you're done, you've done it 100 minutes, and um, you're done. The first thing you do is turn off your stove. I have a gas stove now, yay! I've always had electric, but I have a gas. So all I have to do is turn it off and it's um, off. If you have an electric, try to move your canner off. Have somebody help you, it'll be pretty heavy. And um, you have to wait until this goes all, the gauge goes all the way down to zero. And then you wait, to, and that takes about a half an hour for that to go down to zero. And then you wait another 10 minutes. Is that, is, am I correct? And then you take the uh, jiggler off. I, I know the word is better than jiggler, but okay, you've got the jiggler off now. You can't take it off as soon as it cools down. You've got, I mean, you've got to wait until the gauge goes to zero, then you can take it off, set it off, wait another five minutes, and then you're going to take your lid off and you're going to lift the lid away from you. Can you see that? Otherwise you're gonna get steam in your face, okay? And then you're gonna wait another five, woo, hello. Wait another five minutes before you take the jars out. So again, I'm going to put the lifter in very carefully lift it straight up don't tilt it um, sometimes you're, you feel like you want to get the water off the top don't do that it'll evaporate on its own and set it down on a towel or a mitt don't set it directly on a counter and then you want to not touch it for 12 to 24 hours okay so I have a few questions, yeah. if I may, Eileen. Yeah, go ahead. Is this, is this a good time? Yeah. Should the, should the gauge be calibrated on an annual basis? That is a very good question. Um, I do mine about every two years. Uh, it doesn't hurt to do it every year. The hardware, Ace Hardware, I believe, Hensels and Arcata, they do it for free, and they just check it. And that's probably a good thing to do. Um, you don't have to do it every year, but definitely every other year. Great. And Joyce, on your Presto canner, can you do a third row if they are wide mouth half pints? Yes, I can. If it's a combination of uh, wide mouth and the narrow uh, regular mouth, then I can only do two 
or if it's just the regular mouth, I can only use two. And I wanted to show, I can show the dial on mine. I wanted to show the uh, loading and the actual um, tightening because this lid, you have to follow the little arrows on the lid in order to uh, get it down. Let's see, are we, are we there? Can you see the dial? There. Yes. Yes. So that's the dial. I, right now, I have the heat on high. You want to get it up to the uh, steaming point as fast as possible. And then, as Eileen said, you let that steam come out good and steady for 10 minutes. Now, when the steam first starts coming out, you know, it kind of it kind of spurts a bit as uh, easy to see. But once it is flowing freely, that's when you put down the pressure regulator. Now, mine is different than Eileen's. The pressure regulator on this Presto canner is just this little knob that you put onto uh, the special place, which is next to, <laughs> this is tricky, next to the, um, uh, no, no. Can you see it there? The little knob that sits up? It's a little dark knob. Anyway, that's where the pressure regulator will be put um, so that then the, the dial will go um, up the, to the pressure that you want it to be. All right, thank you. One thing that we didn't mention, and I think that it can be very important, is my stove, seem, it's a gas stove, and it really can run hot. And so I start my canner on my big burner, which is the uh, most powerful. And then I, many times as it goes along, in order to regulate my pressure, I usually use a, a heat diffuser plate. And I just put one of them underneath the canner now, but I have two others I can show you. These are, these are really inexpensive. This is one, you've probably seen these around. They've been around for generations, I think. And this goes under the canner and it helps to diffuse and slow the heat. This is another one that can also be used to, I understand, cook tortillas. So I've got a, a multi-use tool there. And, uh, <laughs> I have yet to use it that way, but those really help with regulating the heat. And you want to keep your heat at your 10 or 11 pounds, but you don't want it going way up to 15 pounds. As soon as you get it over pressure like that, there's a great chance of losing liquid that's in your jars, and there's a greater chance that you're going to break your jars. And Eileen mentioned slowly letting the pressure off of the canning. And if you try to get it uh, off too fast, you will probably, again, lose liquid in your jars as well as break jars. And I've had a broken jar of albacore before, and it's not fun to clean out of the canner. Okay. Just not fun at all. So we've got another question about three rows. So the question is, I thought we could only process a second level of jars if we put another rack between the two. So, and, and I'll, there's, go ahead. There's a rack between each one of those layers. Right, and because you showed them staggered on top of each other. Right, right, you can do that. Mm -hmm. You can stagger them for a third row. Uh, but again, it has to be those squat jars. It cannot be the, uh, the taller, skinnier jars. And are there recommendations for using half pints? Is that versus pints? I'm not sure I get that question. Well, this, these are half pints. Right, right. These are eight ounce jars. And for, for pints, um, I would say that it looks like my canner could take two levels. I've never done pints, so I don't know that for sure, but uh, it should be able to take pints and it would probably be two rows, but never three. Any suggestions of a specific brand of pressure cooker for new pressure canning individuals and estimated cost? It depends on wow. how much you want to spend. Yep. Because the, the type that Eileen has, 
Yeah, it's pricey. I love it. It's made in America. I, I just I just really like the way it is. And it was recommended to me by another master food preserver. I did not have one. But at the at the um, at our ad center where we teach in person, we don't have any all American, I don't believe. All of ours are presto and they're fine. And so they are much less expensive. Oh, well, this was a couple of hundred dollars, Maya. Yeah, yeah. So and I think hundred dollars. I think that the uh, Prestos run somewhere, um, somewhere a little over a hundred, but I'm not really sure of that right now. I haven't priced yeah. one recently. You can, you can find that out online. All right. Sure. So real quick, it's 630. Yeah. Okay. And before we've we've lost a couple people, so I want to ask the two of you, Eileen and Joyce, if we want to put up the feed the eval part first, and then come back if anybody still wants to hang out for to Can see. Can I say something? Can I say yes. something about the jars? Because what you want to do after twelve hours or twenty four hours, take the band off. Wash the jar with hot soap, warm soapy water, get everything off, dry it well, be sure you label it. And I seriously mean that. This is a, a jar of something, it's not tuna. I have no idea what this is because I did not label it, but I keep it because I show it to classes. So make sure you label it. I even put the name of the boat that I bought this fish off 